Thanks very much. Thank you so thank much. You. So good afternoon, and thank you for the chance to be with you. I've got a slightly funny accent. I hope it's not giving you problems. I came originally from Ireland. And the bit of Ireland I was in was quite backward, to be blunt. Um, we all had to sit a test at age 11, boys and girls. And the idea was that at age 11, they can tell with the test result whether you're going to be somebody academic or whether you need a more practical education. For the boys, that means, you know, carrying on through school, studying science and things, or if you're not so clever, maybe an apprenticeship, learning to be a mechanic, something like that. For the girls, however, if you didn't get to stay in school, your options were very few in those days. You could be a hairdresser, you could be a secretary, you could be a filing clerk, uh, you could be an unqualified nurse, and that was about it. And nobody worried because everybody knew, always be suspicious of things everybody knows. Everybody knew that girls were only going to get married, become housewives and mothers, and weren't going to work. So they didn't really need an education. And indeed, in that test at age 11, there was a higher pass mark for the girls than for the boys. You've probably already noticed that around about age 11 or 12, girls on average are brighter than boys. It's just to do with the rate at which people grow up. <laughs> the snag was, because of that test at that age, too many girls were passing and they were keeping the boys out of this proper education. And everybody knew that girls were only going to get married and become wives and housewives and mothers. So they didn't need this special education. It was the boys that needed it. So that's why they had a higher pass mark for girls. So that there weren't too many girls cluttering up this academic, what we call grammar school stream. So I sat that exam and I failed it. It was the first test I'd ever taken and failing it was really tough. But my parents believed in me and uh, they argued with the head teacher of the grammar school and I was allowed into the grammar school stream. And I remember the fun of it. Our first school was like a village, a country school. There were two rooms, two teachers, three, four, five kids in each year, and several years in each room. And then you go into this high school, age 12, and we were a two-form entry, so there were about 60 kids starting in my year. And I also remember very clearly the Wednesday of the first week of the first term. And a message went round the first year class that this afternoon, this Wednesday afternoon, boys to such and such a place and girls to another. And they sent the boys to the science laboratory and they sent the girls to the cookery room. Because girls were only going to become wives and mothers, they didn't need science, they did need to know how to cook, how to make a bed, how to mend clothes. <laughs> And I was very disappointed because my parents had told me that I'd get to do science. I told my parents that night what had happened and they were furious. Um, also in my class was a girl whose father was a doctor, the doctor for the local town. And apparently he was furious because he wanted her to do science. And so did another set of parents. And the head teacher's telephone was a bit hot that evening. And the next time the science class met, there were three girls, three of us, and all the boys. And I don't think that teacher had ever taught girls. He made us sit in the three desks right up against his teacher's desk at the front, because clearly we were dynamite or something like that. Anyway, that first term we did physics. 
and I loved it. And I came top of the class. I'd love to think the school learned a lesson, but schools don't always learn lessons that quickly. Uh, I came top of the class, I got 97%. So I went on and I did physics through high school. Um, chemistry was okay, but my introduction to biology in that first year science was we were given some flowers. We were told to draw the flowers, label the parts, and learn the names. And I thought, boring. And I've had a bit of a prejudice against biology ever since, I'm afraid. But clearly I could do physics. I could also do chemistry, but I didn't like it so much. So through high school, you get, I got more and more chance to specialize and I specialized in physics and math. And I ended up going to university to do a physics degree. Uh, there weren't many women did physics in those days. Uh, really, because there weren't many women got to do physics in school, to be honest. And I ended up the only female in a class of 50, 49 men and me. And while I was still at school, at about age 15, I was wondering, what kind of physics will I do in the long run? I'm liking physics at school. I will probably do physics at college. But after that, I'm going to have to specialise a bit. What bit of physics am I going to specialise in? And one day my father brought home from the public library some astronomy books, quite advanced ones. And I read these and I could see in these astronomy books that the, even the physics we were learning at school was relevant. And so after doing my physics degree, I went to another university, Cambridge, to do a research degree sometimes called a PhD. Um, I spent the first couple of years building the equipment. This was a special kind of telescope to pick up radio waves. And after two years building this telescope, I was the first person to use it. And it worked pretty well. I had to debug it, but it didn't need much debugging. And then I got observing it. Uh, we didn't have computers. My data came out on very, very long rolls of chart paper, you know, squared paper, 30 meters a day. And I did it for six months, so I had about five kilometers or three miles. Telescope worked well, did what it was meant to do, but there was something else on those chart papers that didn't make sense. It wasn't what I was meant to be looking for, some of these very distant quasars, and it wasn't radio interference, which a telescope will often pick up. So this funny other signal I couldn't quite make sense of, and it ultimately turned out to be something that was going pulse, 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 and nobody would ever seen anything like that before. And my thesis advisor thought, it's something man-made, you know, we didn't have mobile phones, but it's, it's something like that. But the snag is, or the nice thing is, it moved around the sky with the stars. Have you noticed that in summertime, there are different constellations in the night sky compared with wintertime? That's because the stars go round at a slightly different rate. They don't keep a 24-hour day. They get four minutes earlier each day. They do 23 hours, 56 minutes. And this thing that was giving the pulses was going round in 23 hours, 56 minutes. So it couldn't really be somebody with something like a mobile phone because they're doing whatever they're doing four minutes earlier each day, 28 minutes earlier a week, and this has been going on for several months. It really has to be something that's going round with the stars, keeping its place amongst the stars. And after a lot of extra work and toil and trouble, these things turned out to be a completely new and unexpected type of star. They've been named pulsars. Indeed, the word pulsar was created to give a label, a name to these stars. 
and great excitement when this discovery happened. Uh, a lot of press coverage and a lot of interesting things coming out of that discovery too. Was my opinion less regarded because I was female when we were working out what the pulsars were? Uh, not at the point we were working out what the pulsars were, but at the point we announced it, uh, there was a lot of press interest. And the typical press interview those days would go like this. There'd be my thesis advisor, my boss, Tony, Tony Hewish, and I. And the journalists would ask him about the astrophysical significance of this discovery. And then they'd turn to me for what they called the human interest. How many boyfriends did I have? Um, would I describe my hair as brunette or blonde? No other colours were allowed. How tall was I? What was my bust, waist, hip measurements? And the photographer was saying, please could I undo some buttons for the photograph? Young women were seen as sex objects and they wanted sexy photographs for their newspapers. And it was horrible. It really was. But I didn't think I could be rude to them and tell them to go to hell or wherever um, because I'm still a student. I haven't even written my thesis, let alone got it passed. And I'm going to need a job and I'm going to need references. I've really got to keep in with the people I'm working with. So that was, that was really horrible, yeah. So what made me want to keep doing physics and pursue it with all this discrimination against girls? Often the things you're good at at school are the things you like. And I liked physics uh, and I was good at it. So I thought it's always a good idea to play to your strengths discover the things you're good at, and then try and arrange your life so as you get to do those things. Um, it's not so easy when you're at school, but you can gradually shift what you do. To, so one quite important thing is to discover what you're good at, and then try and arrange it that you can do it. <laughs>